Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Garden Party. We're your virtual series from the Southern California News Group to give you tips, tricks, and insights for getting the most joy and productivity out of your gardening experience. And also, I have to say, help you find a community of like-minded green thumbs, or in my case, a wannabe green thumb. I'm Sam Dunn, the senior editor for premium content here at the Southern California News Group. I need to say thank you to our Reader Reward subscribers and really to all of you for supporting our virtual programs. By the way, if you are a Reader Rewards subscriber attending today, you're automatically entered to win a $100 gift card to Home Depot, which should help you with some of your gardening needs. And if you're not a subscriber, well, why aren't you a subscriber? Go to scng.com forward slash subscribe to find your local paper and join us as a regular reader. Now, before we get started, I need to remind you of a few things. If you have questions, use the Q&A feature on your Zoom toolbar on your screen. All the questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation today. But certainly, if you want to make comments as we go, use the chat feature found on your Zoom toolbar as well. Also, keep in mind you'll have slides to refer to as we go. And don't worry, you won't miss anything. This session will be videotaped and a link will be sent to you so you can share it or just revisit some of your favorite moments. It's also posted at scng.com forward slash virtual events, and that's where you can find all of our past virtual shows, including Garden Party, Bookish, uh, all of the virtual programs we do here at the Southern California News Group, and you can also see what's coming up. Now, it's my pleasure to say our longtime gardening columnist, Laura Simpson, is going to be taking over with today's presentation, so go for it, Laura. All righty. Well, let me share my screen here. You can see my pretty slides. All righty. So you guys can all see that, right? So, yep. okay. <laughs> this might be talking into the ether here. Okay, so I'm Laura Simpson. I'm a master gardener. I'm also a master food preserver. Um, I have been writing the Press Enterprise or Southern California News Group garden column for about five years, I guess now. Um, I have uh, lots of experience with gardening in Southern California. I have, um, yeah, I've been a master gardener since 2002. I live near Temecula, California, like in the French Valley area. Um, I used to be a medical researcher working with uh, monoclonal antibodies, and, um, you know, infectious disease, and, uh, oncology. And I've got five kids and a husband who's also a master gardener. So let's get started. Okay, so we're talking about small space gardening today. Um, so I kind of wrote this with Southern California um, gardeners in mind, um, assuming that most people have kind of small yards. We're not we're not in the Midwest where you know it's normal to have like an acre or two, or twenty. Um, so we're working with small yards. Um, Courtyards and patios are a big favorite too. If you have a condo or an apartment or something, um, townhouse, a lot of times all you have is a courtyard or patio to work with, but you can grow things on that. And also I'll touch on container gardening, which um, is ideal for small space gardening. So let's start with small yards. Kind of looks like a typical California subdivision here. Um, okay, so considerations. When you have a small yard, um, there are limitations. Of course, you know, space, of course, is the big thing, but also availability of sunlight. Um, the houses are built really close together here. Um, sometimes you have like maybe 10 feet or even less between your neighbor's wall and yours. Um, and also there's the, the fences and the walls that will also kind of limit the amount of sunlight you can get. So a lot of times you'll have a, a like a side yard that's maybe, you know, eight feet wide and maybe hardly gets any sunlight at all. And so you're kind of wondering what what should I plant here? What can I plant here? Um, so just to keep in the mind where where your sunlight's hitting. Um, drainage. If you have if you have a mucky area of your yard, unless you want to grow your own rice paddy or something, you will have to do something about your drainage. Um, most plants do not like wet feet. It's a fast way to kill a plant. And it's just, it's, it gets gnarly. I mean, if you have mud, it can it can start to stink. You can end up mis with mosquitoes if you have a puddle sitting there. So you wanna make sure that you have good drainage. Um, access and ease of movement. You, 
you don't want to go overboard and you know recreate like the apocalypse now okay. i have two dogs that are love to tell me when my amazon package is constant um okay um also it's nice to be able to create an illusion of more space and there's some tricks you can use to to do that okay so sunlight um Here's a good example. Oh, this is a pretty snazzy looking uh, neighborhood. But um, if you have a south or west facing wall, um, it's going to receive more intense sun and heat for better or for worse. So in the summertime, you know, you may not want to put your calla lilies on a south or west facing side of your property because they are going to get incinerated. I mean, where I live, it gets to be, you know, 110 degrees in the summer sometimes. So you're going to want to keep that in mind. Um, north or east facing side is going to be cooler in the summer and actually quite chilly in the winter time because of the shade. Um, keep in mind the shadows cast by your house and your fence and your neighbors and reflected heat. One thing I need to mention is that a lot of people have you know, wooden privacy fences between them and their neighbors. Um, well, and then there, the, you know, the, those but those um, wooden fences break down, look pretty ugly. And then you, you go and replace it with a vinyl fence, which looks really nice. You know, they're very attractive and, and all. But keep in mind, they reflect heat like you wouldn't believe. They actually will, um, they'll reflect heat a lot. Um, I had a neighbor who had bark mulch in front of their vinyl fence and the vinyl fence reflected so much heat that the bark mulch started to smoke. So keep that in mind. I'm not trashing on vinyl fences, just that you you want to be careful with, you know, keep that in mind. That's something that you should you should keep in, in mind and maybe plant something there instead of just keeping bark mulch or, you know, a wood pile or something next to a vinyl fence because of that reflected heat. The um, drainage is a big problem as well. We have crummy soil here, frankly. Um, if you live in a newer subdivision, what they do when they start a subdivision or whenever they plant something, they run, you know, they they drive heavy equipment back and forth over the the space that they're going to build in. Right, that's to compact the soil so it doesn't liquefy during a bigger earthquake. Okay, that's that's a good thing. We don't want ground liquefaction. However, when you go to try and dig into it, it's like trying to dig into concrete. Um, so we do have we do have crummy soil that's su usually super compacted. So this this ends up causing problems with drainage. Um, so what you'll see people do is, you know, the original idea um, back in like when we first bought our first house, like in 1994 and everyone had grass and they what they would do is they would use a curb core and drain pipes you know buried drain pipes and um you know the the surface drains I mean, you see those a lot still um so when the excess rain comes it just it just gets directed away from the house that's a good thing um but um there's other things you can do as well um dry riverbeds have become real popular which is what you see here in this picture um so you have the the pe the pebbles, um, the the Mexican beach pebbles, and you know various sizes of rocks. What is nice about the dry riverbeds is that it slows down the flow of water. This does two things: it helps prevent erosion, and it also keeps the water on the ground for a little bit longer. So it hopefully it can percolate down and and replenish the groundwater. If you have, you know, a curb core and you and that water is rushing away, then, um, you know, it doesn't have a chance really to percolate back down into the groundwater, which we, you know, we kind of need, could use all the groundwater we can get hold of, right? I mean, <laughs> we've kind of been in a drought forever. So that's something that is um, really, really beneficial to the environment and also to your, to your property as well. Um, one thing that works really nice too, you can see they have grass planted alongside the edges of this dry riverbank, which makes it look more natural, but also grass has very fibrous roots. 
that helps prevent soil from washing down into that dry riverbed and making it look kind of, you know, uh, ugly. So that kind of, it kind of anchors it as well. So that's another nice feature of this, of this landscape design. Um, swales and berms, of course, you know, swales, um, that's what you would put the dry, the dry riverbed, the dry creek bed in, and um, berms will help, uh, will help direct the water as well. And of course, the most important thing is, as far as a homeowner, you want to make sure that the water does not sit near the base of your house, near your foundation. So you do want to direct it away. But um, when 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 they build houses, they they ha they have to have it graded so that it directs water away from the foundation. And so that's you want to you want to keep that grading intact, but just to enhance it this way, it looks prettier. So access or ease of movement, um, you know, gardening, you know, it, it usually involves like pushing a wheelbarrow around or pushing the you know the green waste container around. You want to be able to move through your garden. You, you want like a wide enough space. Um, recommending three feet or wider for a pathway. You know, especially like something like this with the arbor, you want to make sure you can get your wheelbarrow through there because it's a real pain in the butt to take like armloads of weeds and um, walk them to the front yard to put in your green waste. You want to be able to to make uh, maintenance as easy as possible. Um, avoid straight lines just because for aesthetic reasons mostly. Um, it helps when you have a curved pathway. It just um, it's more aesthetically pleasing. But also it, it creates an illusion of more space as well. When you have a pathway, you definitely want to have stable material because um, you know, not too cool if you, you trip over stuff. So here's flagstone. This is very beautiful. These are very heavy. Um, you know, you want to make sure that they, they're set into the ground and um, that they're not going to rock back and forth. With flagstone and, and these, these kind of pavers, you want to I like having things like, I believe it's Daimondia um, between those pavers that helps anchor it and keeps them from tilting and, you know, popping up and stuff. So that's something that, that you want to also keep in mind. You don't want to, you don't want to trip. Um, that would be a bummer. <laughs> um, and also uh, permeable pavers. So permeable would be something like this, where if it rains, the, the water can percolate down into the, into the, the ground instead of running off. So they, when they talk about permeable pavers, things like this, you know, um, pay, you know, interlocking pavers are somewhat permeable. Um, of course, flagstone, stepping stones, things like that. Those are um, when they talk about water efficient landscapes. That's what they. Um, that's what they're. That's what they mean. Is is that? So you're creating illusion of more space. Like I said before, the, the curved pathways, that helps as far as, you know, you, you come around the corner and you get a new view of something that you didn't see before. Um, it's um, also like adding vertical interest. In this case, this arbor um, gives you some vertical interest. And, um, you know, you can have a nice, a nice uh, wisteria vine or something on there. Um, you want to keep in mind focal points, too. I mean, in this picture, you have, you know, pots and, um, you know, it's like a, a basket back there, but like, you know, potted plants or a vase or a water feature or something. Also repeating elements that helps tie the whole landscape together. So um, you, you have like repeated colors, you know, uh, flowers that are the same color, you know, or, or different shades of pink. You know, you have, you have like a, it looks like poppies or something in the foreground, and then you have it looks like a red bud in the background. So that 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 kind of ties the whole thing together. Um, you know, I want to mention something about the curved pathways to our our landscape. We have a rather small yard as well. Um, I kind of joke around and say our yard is kind of like a hoarder's botanical edition because um, people give us plants and we can't turn them down. So we have so many plants and trees and stuff. So when I'm looking for my husband, when he's out in the yard, I feel like yelling, Marco, and then he's pull over. I know where to find him. So that can, it can have its drawbacks, but 
but you know, that's part of the fun of it all, right? Okay, so courtyards and patios. This is like way prettier than anything I own. Um, so you, when you consider when you have a courtyard or patio, you that's your private space. You wanna have it kind of like hidden away, right? Um, you want to you want to keep seating available. Um, water features are really nice uh, for reasons I'll tell you in a few minutes. And of course, there's hardscape and container planting. You can use you can use those as a point of interest as well. So for privacy, of course, it's kind of hard to get when you have such small lots, but you can um, partially enclose your space. And here you can see that they used a hedge, you know, these um, topiary type plants and hedges to um, to kind of, you know, give you a little tucked away feeling there. Um, you know, it kind of border, you know, like a planted border or something. Um, overhead privacy as well. If you're if you're if you've got a patio and you have a neighbor who has like a two story house and they're looking out on your patio, um, you know, think about some ways you can generate privacy. Shade trees, something like a crepe myrtle, um, you know, one of these multi-trunked um, patio trees are really nice. It gives you a little bit of privacy and shade. Um, or, an, uh, you know, an umbrella. They have those um, sailcloths that are pretty cool. Um, also, an arbor is nice. This is, they have an arbor back here. You can't see the top of it, I don't think, but, um, but that would provide some privacy for a seating area back there um, where you can imagine what this looked like, you know, without, without the, um, the pathway and without the plantings and stuff, it would have been pretty wide open, but, but the way it is, it's set up here, it's, it looks like it's a nice private area. So very pleasing to the eye. Um, seating, of course, you want to have a place to stop and have a beer. Um, <laughs> um, so this is, you, you know, you're working in the garden, it's hard work. You wanna be able to sit and rest for a little bit, right? Um, also seating can provide a focal point for um, for you to, um, for your garden. Um, it allows you to sit and just kind of look out and enjoy your garden and, um, you know, fire bowl, or you can have like a, you know, a, a little bistro table or something there. If it's something where you can, you know, what's what's the garden without being able to sit down and enjoy it? And then, uh, of course, water features are really nice. There's, um, uh, I love these, I love these big urns with the bubblers. Because one thing that's really nice is you don't have like a, a drowning hazard like you would with a pond or something like that. You wouldn't have, you know, you can have this, you know, little kids around and stuff. Also, the way that the water spills over the edge here, um, little birds love to hang out there right on the edge and um, splash around and stuff, especially like little hummingbirds and stuff. So that's a real fun type thing. A little spill fountain is really, um, really attractive to local birds. So you can you can get some pretty cool visitors there, and um, you know it's it's. Uh, it burbles enough so it can hide a lot, you know, can hide a lot of unwanted sound. And if your neighbor's got some giant rave going next door, it's not going to do that. But, um, you know, as far as distant car noises and things like that, it can it can help disguise it. So um, that's one thing that's really nice about water features. However, all wildlife likes water features. I found this photograph and it's uh, this gentleman had a beautiful pond and he lives in Arizona. And um, I think outside of Tucson. And um, he got up one morning and it was in the middle of summertime and there were three full grown mountain lions breaking out of his pond. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. But um, yeah, you, <laughs> you, you want to make sure that you know, your kind of wildlife you're attracting is not going to eat you. Um, okay, so hardscape and containers. Here's a nice example where you have you know, the vases and um, looks like a little fireball in the background there. And, um, you know, once again, permeable pavers. And here they have um, the pavers with the fine gravel in between, which still allows the water to drain into the into the soil. Um, you know, large containers really, you know, it's something dramatic, you know. And then also uh, decomposed granite. 
which is also something that helps. Decomposed granite is basically um, really fine, fine gravel. So it has it has like no nutrient value for plants, but it um, it it drains fairly quickly. Um, but it's something that that people use in their yard. And so we're going to go with container planting here. Um, so if you want to do container planting, you want to consider like what kind of plants do you want to grow in a container? I mean, a lot of plants aren't amenable to containers. Um, then you want to make sure that you pick the right container. Um, I'll touch on a little bit on soil mixes because there are different kinds of soil mixes. Um, watering setup and maintenance. So choosing your plants. And I do have a I do have a talk, I believe, on house plants in a couple of weeks. So um, I'll go over house plants at a later date. So choosing your plants. I mean, um, Google's a wonderful thing, especially in the garden section. You know, if you see something that catches your eye, we'll go ahead and Google it and see what the requirements are. Does it need does it need like a lot of sunlight? Or does it is it okay in lower light levels? Does it need like diffuse light or can it go into direct sunlight? Um, is it sensitive to temperature? Some plants are very fussy about drafts and things. Um, what kind of watering schedule? Does it need to get watered every single day? Or can you kind of, you know, just like maybe soak it, let it drain, and then it's good for a week or two? Um, also pest susceptibility. There's a lot of um. Uh, for instance, English ivy, I tried to grow it. I've never been able to grow it in California. It has a terrible tendency to get spider mites. And the spider mites really like um, dry, hot weather. So I had great luck in Connecticut where it was, you know, it was kind of humid during the summertime. And then um, during the wintertime, I had, I had pans of water on top of my, my radiator. So they didn't really get bothered by spider mites there, but here I just have not had any luck. So selecting containers, <coughs> you want to make sure if you're planting, um, if you're planting directly into a container, you want to make sure that that container has some drainage. Um, you know, a lot of these big containers will have like maybe a hole about the size of a half dollar, right? Which, um, Usually it's okay, but what you want to do is make sure that um, that the water can drain out of that hole. Um, I, I I had somebody who um, was having a terrible time. They had these big, beautiful vases on their pool deck, and they had um, some sort of succulent, big succulent plants in there, but they kept dying because the, the containers wouldn't drain. Now, the, those big vases had holes in the bottom of them, a single hole, but the fact is that they were sitting directly on concrete and so it was sealed up so it wasn't allowed to drain freely so um i told her you know you need to like get those little feet or you know put it up on, on bricks or something you need to have something you need to lift it up so that the water could flow out of that hole so that's something to keep in mind as well before you spend a lot of money on a big container and more money on a, a you know big agave or something and then have it have it die because the container wouldn't drain. So big and important, very important to have good drainage. Some containers don't have a drainage hole, which you can either drill a hole in there or use uh, like a plastic pot, you know, like a nursery pot, and then just pull it out, you know, water it, pull it out, and let it drain all the way and then pop it back in so that the, the outer container is more like a decoration type thing. Um, uh, salt leaching. You're, you see this a lot with those terracotta pots. They have, um, they have a tendency to um, show the the white salt deposit on the outside of those pots. That's something that we have. We have very hard water here, almost everywhere in California. We, you know, especially when um, when they start tapping into the reservoirs, and um, you'll notice that the water gets extremely hard and so you'll have uh, that salt deposit on the outs just on the outside of those containers um so you may want to scrub that off it's kind of unsightly um 
and occasionally you're going to want to flush that container with a lot of water to get rid of the salt. Salt will build up in, in these containers. Um, heat conductive. So if you have a metal container, if you have a black or dark colored container, um, it's best not to put it in a very sunny spot because it'll cook your plants and it gets very, very hot. Um, if you have your heart set on a dark container on a south facing patio, what you can do is put, um, you know, put your the actual plant pot it in a in a like a nursery pot <clears throat> with those drainage holes, and then set that inside the dark container. Then you have like a little air space that helps insulate. You could also like wrap it in bubble wrap or something. You want to have insulation, but the very inside surface of that pot will get very hot if it's if it's dark or if it's metal. Um, look for UV resistance. Um, a lot of these lighter weight pots that look like ceramic, but they're like a, almost like a foam or resin type thing. They have a tendency to crack and break after a couple of years in the sun. So there are some that are more resistant than others. You might want to um, keep that in mind as well. For outdoor um, outdoor containers, usually bigger is better because you don't want to have to be out there watering three times a day during the summertime. You want to be able to you want to be able to um, water it and have it stay moist for a little bit. Um, also, plants that are put outside they have a tendency to grow a lot faster. They're exposed to more sunlight than say a house plant. So, with house plants you don't want to over, over pot them, so to speak. You don't want to put a little bitty house plant into a big pot because they'll, it'll just dry. It doesn't grow fast enough to take up that pot space. Okay, where am I? Okay, soil mixes. I had a couple of questions about soil mix. Um, you can buy, you can buy a potting soil or you can also, um, you know, you can also make your own. Um, I like the core, the, the bricks you can get, they're like highly compacted. They're just like way cool. They're just like very compacted. You cut you cut open the wrapper and you put it into a, a wheelbarrow or a, a Rubbermaid bin and you add hot water to it and you keep adding water to it and, and fluffing it up. Um, it's, a, it's a nice inexpensive way to get, um, you know, soil material. It's not gonna have any nutrients in it. So it's actually good for like seed starting and stuff. But um, coir compost, uh, uh, vermiculite, uh, you know, you want compost for organic matter for, for um, nutrient value. And then vermiculite helps um, keep it, things fluffy, but also can hold some water. So it kind of modifies the water content. Um, osmocote, I love osmocote for container planting because it's it's like slow release so you you put a handful in there and it dissolves over time so it gives it a steady dose of fertilizer you know, otherwise it's really easy to over fertilize uh, a potted plant and consider your potted plant it's kind of like a captive right you know it, it it's depending on you to provide it with fertilize, fertilizer and water it, it can't send its roots out so it has to um, it has to rely on you. It's kind of a responsibility, like a kid or something. Okay, so worm castings as well. Worm castings are awesome for um, for soil mix, especially for outdoor outdoor plants. Um, I found that worm castings sometimes have worm eggs in there, so I tried putting worm castings in my house, one of my house plants, and I ended up with those little red worms crawling across my kitchen floor. So. Uh, I would recommend leaving worm castings to the outdoor plants for that reason, <laughs> unless you unless it doesn't bother you to have earthworms in your kitchen. Um, then you want to do like a yearly top dressing. Like like I said, the the hard water here, you'll see like it'll leave a crust on the top of your of your um, of your potting soil. You can um, scrape some of that off and then replenish it. Just give it some compost and some some good stuff. Just to just to kind of like refresh the pot, so that's something you could do like maybe once a year if you have a plant that's 
that's a perennial that is, you know, been in that pot for a while. It's never, never overwater. Um, if you underwater, that plant will recover. You, I mean, unless it's like totally, if you if you forget to water for six months, it's not going to survive. But if it's wilting because it's underwater, if you give it a little bit of water, it will perk right back up. If you overwater and it starts to wilt, that means that the roots have started to rot and that plant is a goner and it it pretty much won't recover. You, sometimes you can take mm -hmm. a cutting from the top and try to root it, but for the most part, it's it's fatal if you if you let it sit in water so long that it wilts. Um, make sure you use dilute fertilizer for that reason that you have like it's easy to burn these plants when they're in a pot. Um, you want to flush the salts out. So like maybe once a year, take it out, take it, um, you know, put it, put it someplace where you can, um, you know, just like totally flush, flush the soil. Make sure that the water, the water is coming out the bottom of the pot freely and just, you know, basically rinse the potting soil because, um, the, the salts will build up in the soil and your plant, what you'll see is like the leaf tips will turn brown. That's a symptom of um, salt burn in the potted, particularly in a potted plant. And so if you see those leaf tips turning brown and you see like the white stuff on the pot and maybe a crust on the soil, it's probably time to, it's probably time to, uh, to flush that thing out. Um, so, it's real. It can be tricky to tell whether something is overwatered or underwatered. Um, most of the time, you can tell just by picking up the pot. If it's feeling light, it's underwatered. If it's really heavy, well, it's overwatered. Um, <laughs> if you've overwatered by accident, let's say you're like, oh crud, I, I gave it too much water, but it hasn't started wilting yet, or if it's just starting to look sad, but not this sad. Um, you can, you can possibly recover if you, I've, I've managed to save a few plants this way. We dump out, we dump it out and, um, you know, kind of push this, the muddy soil away from the roots and look for any roots that are black and rotted, trim those roots away to anything that's, that's like slimy root rot. Um, you want to trim away the rotted roots. And you're gonna probably want to trim the top of it, um, the the top of the plant a little bit, and then um, and then replant it in some fresh potting soil that's that's a little bit drier, so that it kind of sucks the excess water away from the roots. I've managed to save a couple plants that way. So if you have something that's you know you're very fond of or it's expensive or you know you want to save it and it's not too far gone, um, that's one way. We call it plant surgery, root surgery, I guess. Um, so that it's it's kind of it's kind of a pain. Um, if you if you dump it out and it's and it stinks, it's probably not good anymore. It's probably the the whole pot's probably got mold and um, you know anaerobic bacteria in there and stuff. So um, something the something the you know. It, give you some hope, <laughs> I guess. Um, okay, so maintenance. If you're doing um, if you're doing it indoor indoor plants, you only want to go up one size. So if you have a six inch pot and, and it is it looks like the you know it's been in there for a while and the roots have filled up that pot, you just want to pot it up to like eight inches if this is an indoor plant or something that's a slow growing plant. Um, outdoor plants you can you can kind of get away with potting up a little bit more aggressively, but usually just one size. You don't want to you don't want to put something that you have in a four inch pot into like a twelve inch pot. Like I said, you'll water it, and that water will sit there in the soil because the roots haven't caught up, and um, they won't take up that water. And so the water sits there in the soil, and you know starts to stink. So pot up one size when it's an indoor plant or something that's slow growing. Um, you want to occasionally trim it, you know, make sure you get like, um, make sure you get the dead stuff off there. If you have 
you know, any damaged damaged leaves are good to trim off, you know. Also wash it off. Um where depending on where you are, usually you get it's gonna be kind of dusty. So dust and dirt on the leaves um will keep it from photosynthesizing. The leaves can't do their job if they're dirty. So um also um dust on the leaves can attract like aphids and, and some other pest insects. So washing those leaves off is, is usually a, a good idea every so often. Um, you're gonna wanna fertilize uh, occasionally, not too much, like I said, Osmoco is just perfect for that. And then um, pest control as well. So um, yeah, with pest control, um, for indoor plants that are, I like I like using bonide. It's uh it's like a, a granular type um uh pesticide. It you want you you sprinkle it onto the surface of the soil, you water it in, the plant takes it up, and so like little there's little um scales or aphids or you know, little mites and stuff, the ones that suck the life out of your plant. Well they that will kill those because you know it's a systemic. And so it's a nice, um, it's a good pest control for, for anything that's not edible. You can use a systemic, um, particularly indoor plants because they're not, you're not, they're not gonna affect like pollinators and stuff. Um, any kind of, uh, for outdoor plants, if you have, if you have like um, aphids or scales or something, um, you can use like insecticidal soap. Do not use Dawn. I've seen it so many times. It, Pinterest is full of really bad ideas. So um, Dawn is Dawn is terrible for plants. It it will strip the cuticle off of the leaves, and then the leaves will dry out, and and the whole plant will die. <laughs> Using insecticidal soap, it will only dry out the insects. That won't it won't affect it won't hurt the plant. So use use horticultural stuff on your plant don't don't you know unless it's something at the, the university of california um agriculture and natural resources um page they do have like a couple of home remedy type things you can use but um for the most part like don't get your info off of pinterest it's just a uh, really people get some crazy ideas and um <laughs> you know Spring, spring vinegar on your plant, not a good idea. You know, Dawn dish soap. Um, you can use oil, like a summer oil or um, insecticidal oil. That's good for like scales. Um, it dissolves their, um, their exoskeleton. So things like that. But um, for the most part, the, you know, Pest control, yeah. Get your get your information off of the um, the pest control section of um, the University of California, which is on my resource page, which is here. So yeah, the, the um, these are this is a good website too. This gardening know how. There's a lot of very knowledgeable people that that write in. It's kind of like a quora type thing where they they'll write articles, and um, I've found them to be quite reliable. Sunset Magazine, really good for um, inspiration, design inspiration. They have the magazine, also the books. Um, Fine Gardening is also a wonderful magazine. Um, I kind of call it gardening porn because <laughs> all those pictures are just unbelievably beautiful. And um, I've never been able to get my yard to look like that. Um, take a local garden tours and see what works with your for your neighbors and for people that live in your town as, as well as local garden clubs. And the garden clubs are worth um, joining because um, especially like in the fall when people are digging up their bulbs and dividing stuff, you can get a lot of free stuff. You know, they have plant exchanges and stuff. So um, the garden, your local garden clubs are, are a real good resource. And then, because um, with California, I mean, you know, the inland area, if you live, say, even in Temecula, I mean, people can grow avocados in Duluth or, up, you know, up the hill. They can grow avocados up there 
And then um, down near Pachanga, where it's like a low lying area, you can grow more of the stone fruit that needs that needs the cooler temperatures, but you can't grow you can't grow citrus there because it does get frost. So even within like one one um, zip code, you can get enormous variability. And so that's where the local garden tours and the local garden clubs come in handy. You can you can find out what works for people. And a lot of times they're, they're, they'll share cuttings and seeds and stuff with you. So I'm all for freebies, right? So anyway, that was the last slide. So well, Laura, we thank doing? you. That was great information. We actually, speaking of local gardens <laughs> and local tours, we the first question of many that we have is, where do we find local garden clubs and local tours? I'm assuming that you list some of them in your uh, ongoing columns with our newspapers, but is there another resource you can recommend? You know, I would try like Facebook. I've seen um, some stuff on Facebook. Um, where else? You know, asking at local local nurseries, maybe not like Home Depot or something, but some of the smaller nurseries. Like Armstrong's. And also to yeah. our audience, I want to say well, we have a whole uh, archive of of a few years of garden party uh, virtual programs. You might want to check that out at our, our virtual uh, archive at scng.com forward slash virtual events. Right. So are you are you game for some questions? We have a- Oh, heck yeah. Yeah, we got plenty of time, so yeah. We're, we're not going to get through all of them, even though we have a lot of, <laughs> even though we have a lot of time. The first one um, concerns water spaces and mosquitoes. We have uh, we have a, a few questions on that. Do bubblers cause mosquito problems? And can you talk about water spaces and mosquitoes? Okay, so mosquitoes, which I, um, you know, everyone was plagued with this last year. Uh, Summer, it seems. I've gotten more mosquito bites this last summer than I have um, since moving to California. Mm -hmm. um, mosquitoes will breed in still water. And so if you have a bubbler, you know, you have like a little fountain or any, anything, any moving water will not, you, you won't get mosquitoes breeding in that. Um, if you have, but that's the good news. The bad news is they only need about a tablespoon or so of water to breed. So they found like, you know, if you have like, say, recycling or something, and, and there's like water collecting in a, in a beer can that you've got in your recycling bin, they can, they can breed in that. They can breed in all sorts of really a remarkably small amount of water, but it has to be still water. Uh -huh. And so like, you know, if you have a wheelbarrow and it doesn't take long, for those mosquito larvae to show up, I mean, uh, maybe a day or two, and then you'll see, you'll look, and there's like little swimmers in your, in your wheelbarrow, in your watering can, or something. So, um, be aware of any place that might have um, uh, stagnant still water, and so that's going to be that's going to be your mosquito breeding breeding grounds. And yeah. a couple of years ago, when we had the the foreclosure crisis and I know right. that the vector control people were just going crazy because Probably all these really uh, going crazy. Yeah. Trying yeah. To Cause the, uh, the swimming pools, imagine right. how many mosquitoes can breed in a abandoned swimming pool. So, so speaking of water um, and proper drainage, we have a question from Casey McDuff. How do you find a contractor who knows how to build a swale for proper drainage and percolation? Do you, do you have any great suggestions for that? I would go with like a licensed um, uh, landscape architect. You know, there's 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 a lot of people out there that are you know there's there's gardening, there's like you can hire a gardener and the, what is it the mow and blow type people, right. um, but you know that's pretty much all they can do is mow and blow. You want to get somebody who is like a, a licensed uh, like a landscape architect because they they go through the the training and they um, they know what they're doing. And they're also more familiar with like local laws and what, you know, the permitting process, because if you're going to do any kind of grading or anything like that, you need to, you need to make sure you have the proper permits or they can, um, you know, that, that can add up to a lot of fines and stuff. California's very, very picky about that. So yeah, we go with, a, um, you know, somebody who's, who's licensed as a landscape architect. 
shifting There's guard designers and stuff, but the architect is what you want to what you want to look for. Right. Shifting gears uh, to the question of pots for container gardening. Do okay. terracotta pots get too hot in the summer? A, a audience member wants to know. Um, you know, it depends. Uh, pine nuts hot is uh, like a black ceramic pot. Mm -hmm. Um, one thing with the uh, terracotta pots is I, I've seen P. L. Smith. I love his his stuff. He um, what he does is he he uses like a sealer on on the terracotta pot, and then he use he just puts like a he puts the nursery pot inside the terracotta pot. So that airspace will insulate, it helps insulate from the heat. So the roots aren't right directly against the um the pot. So that helps. And if it's um if it's really bad, you can you move the pot or you can um or you can um you know theoretically you could you could use like bubble wrap or something, you know, some sort of insulation to um protect that to protect the roots. Yeah. Good. Well, we have yeah. some questions on types of soil and potting. Um, Lynn Hunt wants to know if, excuse me, peat moss is recommended. And also Sylvia Watkins wants to know, can I make potting soil for my succulents? If so, how? Oh, so um, yeah, succulents, uh, you can use, uh, I think um, use like a sand, but they do have potting soil for succulents. And usually it involves, uh, it's usually not very nutrient rich. So it may, um, and it's not gonna hold water, but it usually has like sand or something in it. I do not have a recipe for um, for uh, potting soil for succulents. Okay. Um, I have, I have my, my one recipe for um, potting soil would be for our, our we have blueberries in um, half whiskey barrels and of course blueberries need acid so we have there's a, a potting soil recipe we use for those guys but um um there should be something you know i would there's like a also on the internet i'm sure there's like a succulent society there's like there's like there's all different plant societies and plant groups there's a cycad society um so if you go onto one of their one of their websites, they probably do have a recipe that would be that would be helpful. And but I, off the top of my head, I don't have one. I also want to recommend to to the audience member do look at our archive because we have covered succulents and native plants before. And I know mm. that's coming up uh, ne next time, but we've also covered it in the past. And you might just do a little digging through the archive. Um, yeah. uh, uh, question: Do you have to throw out potting soil after a few years, or can you just supplement? Um, if you have a problem with disease, I would throw it out. Um, you know, and also, you know, if you have like a big pot, you, I mean, do you really want to dump that whole big pot out and, <laughs> you know, replace the potting soil? No, probably not. So that's why the, the idea of top, top dressing. So if you have, you know, something that's, that's kind of big and it's, you know, that plant's been in that pot for a while and you have no desire to dump this thing out and replenish it. Well, just like scrape off the first few inches of soil and then just just um, just put like compost or something, refresh it that way. So that's what they call top dressing, I guess. But um, that should, that should um, do the trick. Great. And we have a question. Excuse me. Hold on just one second. My frog's in my... <laughs> Erica's recovering from that nasty oh. cold. Uh, yeah. Oh, I hope not. Erica LeBlanc asks, what is a good source for brown material for compost? She, she says, I have mainly kitchen scraps, but don't have ready access to brown stuff. And I have now. Mm. Um, okay. Yeah. You want to have like, you want to have enough browns to, to, uh, cause otherwise your compost was stink and get icky. Um, when we were first, we, we have a we have a lot of brown material. I mean, shredded paper. Um, at one point, I was going going to Home Depot to their lumber department and getting bags of sawdust. That's a lot of carbon right there. 
So that, and that sucks up a lot of the excess moisture. That's another um, good source of, of carbon. Um, one thing that Jim likes to do is he'll get a bale of straw. Don't use hay. You use straw as wow. you know, the bedding that doesn't have the seed. You know, the hay has seed heads in it, right? You don't want to use that. Get the straw and then just like um, he runs over it with a lawnmower to chop it into little bits. And um, then he, he uses that both for um, mulching, particularly in the vegetable garden. He'll put a big layer of, of that on, you know, where our tomatoes are planted. And um, he'll also mix it in with the compost if it's if the compost is getting too gooey. Um, dried grass clippings, which you know, if you if you have a lawnmower with a bag, you may want to spread that out and let them dry and then throw them into the compost pile. Wet, fresh grass clippings are going to be green, but, um, but if you let them out to dry, then um, dried leaves from raking up in the fall. And yeah, uh, there are lots, yeah. of, lots of potentials. Yeah. We have, another, we have another question. Sylvia Watkins asks, after flushing out salt, does anything more soil or fertilizer need to be added to the soil after flushing out salt? Um, you know, it depends on when you flush it out. Um, I don't recommend adding fertilizer like right before the winter time or right before a dormant season. Uh -huh. Because um, particularly if you, you know, if you, if, giving a plant fertilizer tells it, you know, grow leaves. So it's going to grow these little leaves. And then if it's dormant season, it's going to drop those leaves. So it's like wasted a whole bunch of energy growing new leaves. That's just going to drop. Or if it's something that's frost sensitive, um, the new leaves are much more susceptible to frost damage. And so you, you don't want to push a lot of new growth right before a dormant season or do, do, right before winter time. If you're fleshing out in the springtime, yeah, sure. Just go ahead and add a little bit of um, compost or a handful of Osmocote or something. Um, but it doesn't, the, the flushing of the salts out doesn't really, doesn't. I don't say it like takes out all the nutrients, but um, you know, it, it's mostly gonna work on the, the salts. Fair enough. Michelle Gambarudi and Deborah McManus had a question on the name of the pesticide you mentioned. Bro, is it bonide? How do you spell yeah. it? Uh, B o n i d e. It's um, it's uh, it's systemic pesticide for houseplants. Don't um, I don't recommend using systemics for outdoor plants, particularly flowering plants, because it can poison the bees. Because that systemic means it, the plant takes it up and it goes all the way through the plant. Uh -huh. And so it can show up in the flowers, in the leaves, you know, and that's why you don't see a lot of systemic um, pesticides for that are approved for edibles or fruit trees because of that. But um, for a houseplant, you're not, you're not worried about the bees visiting your houseplant. Um, so I, I like using bonide for, um, for, for indoor like houseplants. Not, not the outdoors though. Speaking um, of edible plants, we have a question. Um, an attendee says they have been told not to fertilize herbs, basil, etc. Is that correct? Hmm, that is a myth. Um, Interesting. Actually, um, herbs do like decent soil. I mean, I've read so many places where it's like, oh, you know, herbs like crappy soil. It's like, well, they might survive in crappy <laughs> soil, but they don't like crappy soil. Nobody likes crappy soil. So. <laughs> except for maybe like stink net or one of these horrible like weeds but um no herbs like they like decent garden soil too uh -huh. so, yeah so you you, you want to you want to um give it give it some compost or a little bit of fertilizer or something one more question be because this is about small container and and sure. believe me everybody we'll have future shows that that will answer some of your other questions. There's so many. Lisa Lippert wants to know if how can I tell if my potted trees need to be repotted into a larger pot, and how do I do this to keep from hurting the tree? Um. Okay, if you have some of the signs that a plant probably wants to get into a bigger pot, or if the roots are starting to grow at the bottom of the pot, uh, in which case, a lot of times. If, if it's on the ground, <laughs> those roots can like 
they could be sneaking. They'll get down there and spread, and you won't be able to move that pot. You're not going to transplant that thing because you're not going to be able to move the pot. So, um, but that's one sign is um, if you see roots starting to come out because then they're, they're they want to they want to like spread their wings and move up, move out. Um, sometimes Banana. you'll see like the the pot itself is like packed with roots. Um, you. <sighs> you know sometimes sometimes it's just that you're you're not going to be able to transplant when it's when it's big yeah. it's just not worth it's not worth throwing your back out over it and just like top dressing just refresh the soil you know okay. yeah well sadly that is all the time we have today there are dozens of other questions um thank you laura we're going to see you next uh, time. thanks yeah write to me and then uh yeah right to the southern california news group and you might yep. see it up in the column there. Uh, uh, absolutely. Um, meanwhile, we, we've got California Natives coming up on <laughs> February 21st. And if you register for that program, you can catch up on virtual programs you've missed. And there's a lot of back information, folks, by going to scng.com forward slash virtual events. It's free. It's there for the taking. And as Laura said, if you'd like to share your thoughts from today or you, if you have additional questions, just email us at events at scng.com. We'll, we'll make sure these, these get to Laura. I'm sure they're going to be fodder for, for future columns and Keep reading us, folks, and keep coming back. Thanks so much. We'll see you again. Great. Right. Cool. Bye.